In addition to speaking, her apostolates have included working with elementary school students, parish ministry, coaching high school volleyball, and co-hosting a Catholic radio program. Her story has been featured in the Seattle Times, the National Catholic Registry, and heard on Revelant Radio, Catholic Answers Live, Sirius XM, EW2N's Life on the Rock, as well as Stupidville conferences in Shalom Medium Network. Sister Marion speaks often on topics of theology of the body, authentic love, the healing power of Christ, conversion, the dignity and beauty of the woman. Her first book, as you'll see outside of uh, the hall, is um, Loved As I Am. It was released November 3rd, 2014. And she has a blog, and she has a Twitter account, One Groovy None. So I really would have the pleasure of welcoming Sister Mary James. Thank you. Good evening, how are you this evening? Is it, can you guys, is, can you hear me okay in the back? Is that okay, good. Um, so I actually live right now in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is two hours north of Mexico. So it's a little warm there already. So I have to say that this weather's been delightfully cool, but I've heard you guys have, have had an awful winter, so this is like the best thing that's ever happened to you in the last six months. Um, so and I, yes, and Miss Annabelle invited me and she said, you know, we'd love to have you come out to Toronto and I do frequent uh, this side of your border very often and I was delighted to come. And she said, we're not just going to make you work, we're actually going to take you out to have some fun. So, yesterday, there's this little river of yours, okay? And, um, so, actually, when we got to the American side, she and Father Toby tried to push me out of the boat uh, back onto the American side. But I clung onto the side for dear life, and I wouldn't let go. And so we made it to the, I think this is Annabelle's head right here, she wouldn't get out of the way, okay? So, made it to the Canadian side, and we absolutely loved it. And it was something that was so beautiful. And I'm sure this is part of, you know, we did like the whole tourist thing, and we wanted to get a barrel and go over, but we didn't. Um, and, uh, I mean, but you probably do this all the time. And I think there's sometimes, you know, we get used to things in life. And maybe it's our spouse, maybe it's our family, and we just kind of get used to things. And there's something amazingly beautiful happening 24-7 in your own backyard that we sometimes forget about, don't you think? And I, I don't know, I, I live in community, and um, our life is not like the sound of music, thank you very much. Okay, so there's no hills, there's no mountains in Texas, so we don't sing with guitars. Uh, we're shockingly normal. I was telling somebody the other day that I was at a conference some time ago when there was a teen conference and afterwards, after the talk, one of the mothers came up to me and she was laughing and she's like, sister, I have to tell you that she said, my, night, my grade nine daughter is here. So after your talk, I went up to my grade nine daughter and my, I was like, so what'd you think? What'd you think of Sister Miriam? And her daughter shook her head and she's like, yeah, she's cool. She's almost normal. And we're like, yeah, she's <laughs> almost normal, but not right. Um, but I belong to a missionary community called the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And we serve in areas across the world. As you heard, I've served in different missions across the world. And we, uh, a bishop invites us into his diocese and we do whatever work he asks us to do in teams of priests, sisters and laity. And sometimes people you know, look at me and they look at us, they look at our life and they say, how, how do you do that? Like, how do you do what you do? And I often say that um, when you're in love, you'll do whatever it takes, right? And I think ultimately that's what we long for. We long for an experience of authentic love. And so during at the high schools this week, that's what I've been speaking of a lot is what is authentic love? And why do we just long for intimacy and long for union and long for communion? Why does that burn so deeply in our hearts? Why do we desire? One of the greatest saints we will ever know is a saint named St. Augustine. You talk about a man of desire. And in this letter, this treatise in the first letter of St. John, he says that the entire life of a good Christian is an exercise of holy desire. And I love this. He says, simply by making us wait God, he increases our desire, which in turn enlarges the capacity of our soul, making it able to receive what is to be given to us. I was telling the teachers earlier this week that that first sentence, I had to read it several times because I was like, are you sure? The entire life of a good Christian is an exercise of holy desire? Because I thought it was an exercise of holy obligation, right? You go to church every Sunday and you, you fill out all your boxes and you do the right thing. And I guess it's like this mathematical equation of this plus this plus this makes me a good person and I'm just going to be good. And people say that to me all the time. They say, sister, you know, come on, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. I'm like, if that's a standard of good person today, I, I hope it's not. Because people say that a lot to me. But I often tell people that, you know what, Jesus Christ did not come to earth and suffer and die for us so we could be good people. He came that we might have life and have it to the full. And I don't know about you, but I want to live a full, authentic, abundant life. And so it, what we see is like this sociological study in the, the words of St. Augustine saying that what time, what sometimes what God does is God makes us wait because he wants to fill us with something better. 
So if you women that you've been pregnant, you know a little bit about enlarging and stretching, yes? <laughs> you know what that's like. And it's, it's a sacred time. And if the child comes too early, then the child's got problems because he's so little. He, I mean, his organs aren't formed enough and he needs a lot of medical attention if the baby comes too soon. And it's this whole journey of a woman, you know, she, like Dr. Alice von Hildebrand says, a woman receives a microscopic seed and gives back an immortal soul. And she, and, and her waiting, and the family's excited, and everybody's waiting, they can't wait to, just to welcome this person into the world. It's this beautiful time of enlarging, and so what God is doing a lot of times in our life, you know, when we talk about joy, which joy is not just happiness. I, I read an article one time that said, anybody who desires pleasure surely desires happiness. And anybody who desires happiness surely desires joy. And joy ultimately is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It grows on the tree of the one who is full of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't reside just in the emotions. It actually permeates into the soul and abides in the intellect and the will. And it gives us this pervading sense of well-being no matter what our circumstances. And if you know people that are joyful, I know some people that have suffered tremendously. And this joy, and it's not like a, a put on, this joy that just emanates from them, even though their life is difficult, it is so beautiful. I think, I don't know about your society, but I know society where we live in America, there's so much unhappiness and so much brokenness. And we so often buy into the lie that if we just had more stuff, if we could just do whatever we want, don't tell me what to do because I want to be free because freedom's a big thing, but we are missing the whole point. The human person is ordered toward God. And it is his desire to fill us with himself. And John Paul II, in his encyclical on the Gospel of Life, I was sharing this with a teenager this last week, he says that in the other person, whether man or woman, there is a reflection of God himself, who is the definitive, and definitive goal and fulfillment of every person, the final goal and fulfillment of every person. So your spouse, the people that you live with, the people that you pray for, the people that you work with, every single one of them bears a reflection of God himself. And the example that I was giving to them was I often travel. And uh, I sometimes travel through the airport in Atlanta, Georgia. And the Atlanta airport is one of the biggest airports in the world. And they move people, tens of thousands of people, every day through that airport. And I, I was thinking about it. I don't think I've ever been there one time that it wasn't packed with people. You know, sometimes you go to an airport, you just want to find like a little place where there's no people. I was like, what are you guys people doing here? Go away, finally. You know, but there's all these people in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. So I was going up from the terminal to the baggage claim, up and out, and somebody was picking me up. And I'm, you know, they have four or five escalators just packed full of people. And I'm standing there with my, you know, my little hand on the dreamy handrail, you know, just kind of off in my own little world, thinking about whatever I do when I do that. And, and all of a sudden, it was as if God said to me, look around. And I was like, what? He's like, look around. <laughs> so I just started to look around. And I noticed people that were very well-dressed businessmen, very wealthy businessmen. I noticed people that had some pretty shabby clothes on. I noticed people speaking in different languages from all over the world, and some of them were very excited. And I don't know what they were looking forward to, but they were certainly looking forward to whatever it was. And then I noticed people that were really unhappy. And I don't know what they were looking, I don't know what they were dreading when they got off the escalator in Atlanta, but they looked pretty unhappy. And uh, I don't know, maybe some of them hated God. Maybe some of them were atheists, some of them maybe loved God. I don't know what their relationship with God is, but God was imparting to me that he said, you look into their eyes and you see that everyone bears my reflection. Every single person. And some of them were like, sister, are you sure that person I live with every day, like that person? <laughs> like. They reflect, they bear the reflection of God, yes. And it's easy, isn't it? Sometimes we kind of get used to people that we live with, and like I said before, I live in community, and sometimes you just, you know, it's hard to kind of rub, you're like the sandpaper to the masterpiece, so to speak, you know? But this is where our teaching is Catholic. This is where our teaching on the pro-life movement comes from. It's not a political issue. It's part of what it means to be human. Because God will never, in the whole of history of time, God will never, ever, 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 ever recreate or recycle or reincarnate a single person till the end of time if he ever stops creating people. So the beauty that we see just in the eyes of the other is staggering. And I would say this, especially for us as women, that's one of the ways that we struggle a lot with, I think, our appearance and who we are. When we look in the mirror, what we're seeing is not a compilation of parts or like another zit or whatever, whatever you have on your face that morning. What you're seeing is a reflection of God himself. And I think sometimes I know when I look at my own life and I look at my own wounds, it's hard for me to understand. I'm like, Lord, you know, I, I want to be fully alive, but I, see, I want to be full of joy, but I see all these parts of my heart that it just are not integrated. 
And God gazes back at us because he comes as, you know, a person. He gives himself for us. God is alive and well, and he's always trying to heal us and set us free. Because his desire is that we come to him to the fulfillment, the satisfaction of our souls. This is why stuff won't make us happy. I was telling the teens that earlier this week, like, this is an iPhone 5, and maybe somebody might give me an iPhone 6 next month. But I promise you that even if I get an iPhone 6, it's not going to totally make me happy, as amazing as that would be, okay? Right? Because it's just a thing. And so often we try to stuff all these things in here, and that's people, that's relationships, that's accolades, that's money, that's status. We're so funny like that, you know? And God desire that he continually encounters us again and again and again and again and again because he loves us. And Pope Francis, as you know, has been speaking extensively about joy. His letter, he writes this, he says, the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, from sorrow, from inner emptiness and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. And for a long time, I could not understand how those two would go together. Because I had a very funny image about God. And I think it's very important for us, you know, in the catechism it says, Christian, know thyself. Know thyself. And I was horrified to find out, I grew up Catholic, and, um, you know, I didn't go to Catholic school, I went to public school, but we went, we went to church every Sunday. My mom made us go to church every stinking Sunday we had to go as a family. My brother and I, like, you've got to be kidding me. We to go to church every Sunday. She made us go every Sunday. I did the whole CCD thing, and I learned all the rules, so to speak, but I had never met this man. I had never had an encounter with him. And so I couldn't understand how Christ, God, and joy could go together, or joy of God and freedom, or God and love. It just seemed so separate from one another. And then when I compiled that onto all the brokenness I had in my life, I was like, mm -mm. I don't see how this could possibly go together. And yet when you read the Gospels, this is always going together. Because Christ is always coming into people's lives. You know, I think about the story of the widow of Nain. This widow who is obviously a widow, her husband has died, and now her son has died. And for a Jewish woman to be a widow and then to have her son die, she's lost her status in society. She's probably completely and totally impoverished. And that woman is broken. And whenever Christ goes somewhere in the gospel, there's always people always following him. There's always these crowds, you know? It says that in some places that were so many, they couldn't even eat. There were so many people coming in day and out. Touch us, heal us, please deliver us up. Just help us. And of all the people that were clamoring for the attention of Christ, he sees her. And he's got a huge entourage of people following him, and she's got this you know, big funeral procession, and she's following her son that she's about to bury, and I could only imagine her just lost in her sorrow. And Jesus, see, he sees her. And he goes right up to her, and he, he goes up to her, and he says, woman, don't weep. And he's not, you know, telling her not to be emotional, but he's like, look at her, saying, don't, don't weep, don't weep. And he stops the funeral procession. And he tells the young man, he says, young man, I tell you, arise. And the man sits up and begins to speak. I mean, we'd probably pass out if that happened. You've been to funerals. Like, if that happened at a funeral, you'd pass out, you know? And people went away. They were just overwhelmed, and they glorified God. And I can only imagine what that moment was like when that young man sat up. Oh, and Jesus reunites he and his mother. I'm sure the joy, just the overwhelming, like, awesomeness of his grace would just be something so far beyond anything she could possibly imagine. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, like, does God really see us? You know, we're not deists. Deists believe that God creates the world and he stands at it back from a distance and kind of just watches in the distance. Like Bette Midler had that song so many years ago, from a distance. I'm not going to sing it for you, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, have this song. God does not watch us from a distance. He loves us so much, he becomes one of us. A man like us in all things but sin, because sin actually diminishes our humanity. And sometimes we think it's like an act of freedom or it's an act of, you know, voluntary will. They don't tell me what to do. You know, if you ever watch little kids at the daycare, at one time they will put their hands on their hips and be like, you're not the boss of me, you don't tell me what to do, you know. And you're like, I'm, I actually am, get your crayons and go back inside, I am the boss of you, right? <laughs> but sometimes we do that to God, like, mm, you're not the boss of me, don't tell me what to do. And really, honestly, how God reveals himself, um, God does not, quote unquote, desire to be the boss of us. He desires to heal us and set us free, that rivers of living water and joy pour forth from our heart out of union with him. Um, if this painting looks familiar to you, uh, you might recognize it. It's a painting called Jesus, Prince of Peace. And it was painted by an eight-year-old girl named Akiana. 
And when she was four years old, she began having visions of heaven, and um, that was kind of disconcerting to her parents because her parents were atheists. And on purpose, they had taught her nothing of God. They had no TV, no radio, nothing. And they, their words, they did not want to quote unquote poison her with the idea of God. And at four years old, she begins having visions of heaven. And at eight years old, she has a vision of this man, whom she instinctively knows as Jesus Christ. So she asks her mom for a sketch pad, and she begins to sketch this man, and she wants to draw him. But there was nobody in her town that she could use for a model that would, that would come and sit for her that looked enough like this man she had seen. And this is her theology. She's in her early 20s now, but this is her theology. She said, um, I painted this half. She said, I painted this half of his face in the dark to represent his suffering. But I painted this half of his face in the light to represent his resurrection. And I call him Jesus, Prince of Peace. Uh, the original painting is about this tall, and you could see her uh, pictures of her as a little girl standing on her tiptoes painting the painting, you know. Um, the parents are having construction done on their house, and they're kind of in a quandary over who's going to come, who, what man in their town is going to come sit for their daughter so she can sketch him. She needed a model to sketch the painting, the, the vision that she had seen. And I kid you not, a carpenter shows up to their house, right? Carpenter. Who looks like this. <laughs> and uh, the, can you imagine that awkward conversation? Let's just think about that one for a second, like that whole awkward. So my daughter's having visions of heaven. I mean, how would you even, as a mother, how would you even approach that? But so the mother approaches the man and she says, you know, my, my daughter's having visions of heaven and she wants to sketch the man she believes is Jesus Christ. And that man is a Christian. And he actually is so overwhelmed at that point. He says, he says, I am not, I am not worthy to sit for my master. He said, I can't do it. And he walked away. And later he reconsidered. And he came and he sat for that little girl for 40 hours while she sketched him. Um, if you read the book or if you saw the movie, uh, Heaven is for Real, and I'm not making a comment on either one, but you'll know there's a part in that story. It's a story of a little American boy who has a near-death experience and goes to heaven and sees Christ. And part of the story, the dad's you know, sitting there at the kitchen table putting out all the pictures of Christ over the centuries, just different drawings of Christ. And as soon as the little boy saw that one, he said, that's him. That's the man I saw. That's him. Just interesting to think of, and one thing that I love to share about this story is that Akiana, the, the artist of this painting, she said that there's colors in heaven that don't exist on earth. And she has to just make do with what's on earth. <laughs> what? Right? Who does that? But there's colors in heaven that don't exist on earth. It's said so often that our view of God is not too big. It is, it is far too small. This is why we long for beauty. This is why we long for eternity. This is why we long for more, because we are made for more. It's something that goes so deep within us. We're made for God. We're made by God. We're made for Him. We're made out of His love, out of His authentic love. Um, another piece of art you might recognize a bit more than that one is a, a painting on the Sistine Chapel called The Creation of, of Adam. And this is obviously, if you've ever been to um, Rome and you've been to the Sistine Chapel, you've seen this at the top of the Sistine Chapel. And a uh, very interesting thing about Michelangelo is that I love to talk about art because it adds so much beauty to, to our life. And Michelangelo uh, actually considered himself a sculptor. And if you know the statue of the David, if you go to Florence, you've ever seen the David, this 20, massive, massive 20 ton, 14 foot statue of this young man, King David, before he's, before he's about to go into battle. It's this huge, huge piece of marble. And Michelangelo said that that piece of marble, it was like a 20-ton block of marble, had sat in a rock quarry for 20 years. And it had a major flaw in it, and no other artist wanted to have anything to do with it. But Michelangelo said as soon as he saw that block of marble in the rock quarry, he said he could see the David in the marble already. And he said all I had to do was take away the parts of the marble that weren't the David, and the David emerged. And I love that, because I think that's so often in our life. We are a masterpiece. We're the only one that God will ever create of us, and we're a masterpiece in the works. And so what sometimes what God is trying to do is trying to move all the excess marble that's not part of the masterpiece. And sometimes he does that through encouragement and affirmation. Sometimes he does that through sandpaper, through the difficulties of life. But all of it is always guided by the hand of God. And if we are really open to him, he will make a masterpiece even out of what seems to be the worst possible thing that could possibly happen. Because God makes beautiful things. He gives beauty for ashes. That's what God does. And so Michael, Michelangelo considered himself a sculptor first and a painter second. So I'm like, if this is your side job, is your second best gift, you're doing pretty good. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so here's Michelangelo. And you might recognize this very well, obviously. You probably recognize this part. God the Father and David in all his glory. And John Paul II refers to Michelangelo as the painter of the theology of the body. Just the beautiful, 
sculpting of a human body. And you, you would probably recognize this part here, right? If you saw this, sometimes you see there's just this, you'd recognize that God is giving life to Adam. Well, a lot of people don't realize is something that I found fascinating about this particular painting and this creation, this creation of beauty and joy and love and communion, is that something art historians believe is that Michelangelo probably studied cadavers, even though it was illegal at the time. And they think that because they're finding things in his paintings that he would not have known had he not studied cadavers. So, case in point, if you look here, behind God the Father, you're going to see a red cape that looks like the top of a human brain. Okay, this part here. This represents the mind of God. And who is tucked next to God's heart, safely in his arm, but Eve? This is Eve. And she's right next to his heart. And she has her hand on his forearm, and she's tucked safely right there next to his heart. And it's almost as if God is saying, I'm about to give you, Adam, the creation closest to my heart. Are you ready? Are you ready? So it's like he's looking into date, to, to Adam's eyes about to give him, to give him the gift, this beautiful gift. Because as we know, at the top of all creation, beyond the stars and the sea and the, the birds and the, you know, the cattle, it's, it's male and female, it's man and woman. The crowning glory of all creation made in the image and likeness of God. And I love how God continues, he doesn't even have to, but he continually reveals himself to us. God, it is immense love for us. And not a love that's equated with emotion, but a love that gives of itself without counting the cost, that gives to the very, 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 very end to set us free. You know, it's said that Jesus Christ comes on a search and rescue mission. Amen. Yeah, he does. And so it is our desire. That's why our deepest desire is if we allow God to heal them at the source. Yeah, up here they might be broken and a bit twisted, but if we allow God to heal them at the source, what they will do is they will actually bring us into communion with him. But it is his desire to heal us, to clean us, to cleanse us. And so St. Augustine in that homily, in that treatise, in the first letter of John, he'll go on to say this. He says, if God wishes to fill you with honey, and you are full of sour wine, also known as vinegar, okay, <laughs> where is the honey going to go? Um, the vessel must be emptied of its contents and then be cleansed. If you had a vessel, if you think about a vessel, and one thing that Miss Annabelle has found out a lot about me this week is I love coffee, like, love it. It's, it's probably an addiction, let's be really honest, okay? So, um, and so at our house in, in Texas, you know, we, we have a holy hour at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not a morning person, so it's like 5.20 and I'm cranky. And so well, I've set the coffee and I, so, you know, perks at, at 5 o'clock in the morning. So I go downstairs and I actually have, it, it's actually a soup bowl, like with a handle, okay? It's a soup bowl, all right? So uh, I have my soup bowl sitting out there with my little handle and I, I fill up my coffee cup and you know I don't know what that scientific term is to where like it actually like bows over the surface right before it spills it's like that little bubble on the top you know and so I live up two flights of stairs and so sometimes I feel it's so full that I, I forget that I need to put half and half in it because it's like liquid gold so I, I add a half and half to the coffee and then it's getting so full and then you're kind of in a quandary and it's five o'clock in the morning and you're only you're still half asleep so then I take my cup and then I've got to navigate two flights of stairs with this like <laughs> It's like bowed over a coffee cup, you know, it's about ready to spill. And so I'm taking it up the stairs, and it's like Hansel and Gretel, but with coffee drips, okay? So I'm going up the stairs, and the sisters always know that I'm awake because there's like coffee drips all the way to my room, you know? So I, I balance the cup, and I kind of sit down, and inevitably I'll probably spill it on myself at some point. But I cannot fill any more of that cup. Like, I filled it to the top, so I'm going to get a second one just for fun, right? So it's so full. Now, if I, have, if I want to fill it with something, or if I want to fill it with something else, I'm going to have to empty it out. And then you can't just empty it out because if you put water in a coffee cup, you get like the diluted coffee flavor, right? So then you have to clean the cup. And then I'm going to fill it with something else. And so I think if we're honest with ourselves, we probably admit that we have a little bit of vinegar in our hearts, some places, you know? And so what God desires to do is he desires, because he wants to, by stretching our desire, like we talked about before, he wants to not fill us with stuff or fill us with passing things. He wants to fill us with himself. So what he's going to do is he's going to come into our life and he's going to empty our life of a lot of things. And he's not going to just empty us and then cleanse us just to have an empty and clean soul. He's going to empty us and he's going to clean us so he can fill us with himself. And the interesting thing is, like we talked about, in all the different ways of our life, these, these things happen. Sometimes these areas of our life can be very, very broken because we can be full of vinegar and not know it. Have you ever said something and it comes out with this harsh edge on you? You're like, I can't believe I just said that. 
or like it's, it comes out with another way where your your heart is, you know, from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus says. Have you ever said something and you're like, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe, I didn't know I thought that about myself. I had no idea. And we do that sometimes to each other and we create like a lot of struggle at times, you know, because words have a lot of power. Um, I was showing a clip earlier to the teens of um, just uh, some adults talking about things they would like to change about themselves. And it was real people talking about real things. And two of them said, at least two of them said, when I was younger, kids said I had big ears. They're like, hey man, you got Dumbo over there. Look at that guy with those big ears, you know? And this other, well, this other girl was like, I'd like to change my forehead because when I was a kid, they made fun of my forehead. They said, man, your forehead's so big, you're like a five head. <laughs> and she's an adult and she remembers that. And I wonder how many of us have those experiences where it's like we take on these labels we take on these things that we've been, it's almost like, you know, there's a book by Max Lucado where the, the people put dots on each other and there's all these opinions and all these ideas of other people and then maybe all the areas that were broken and how we see ourselves and our brokenness and what was so beautiful as a masterpiece is like covered over with all this soot, right? And if you saw the movie Cinderella, if you've seen the latest one to come out by Disney, it's very, very good. And Father Robert Barron, I love Father Barron, he speaks often on different topics, and he speaks a lot on philosophy and theology, of course, but he also speaks a lot about pop culture. And he had a seven-minute little video about Cinderella. I'm like, Father Robert Barron's talking about Cinderella. <laughs> you have to check this out. So he was talking about why we're attracted to this story. And we all know the story, whether if you've seen the latest version of it or not, we know the story of the young girl who's loved so much by her parents, and her parents pass away. And she's kind of inherited by the stepmother who married the father, and the stepmother's very, very cruel to her. And what was once beautiful, what was once pure, has become very broken. And her heart's go out to her, and as we know that you know, she's invited to the ball, and she wants to go to the ball, but her stepmother and her stepsisters make her life miserable. And her just her one desire is to go and see the prince. You know, um, Father Robert Barron was talking about why we're so attracted to this story of the girl of Cinderella, and he said because really it's a story of salvation history. And he said here's humanity with God, and then through sin humanity falls and becomes sort of full of soot, full of dirt, so to speak. And we buy into all the lies of the evil one. We buy into all the lies of the brokenness, the things that other people tell us about ourselves, and and we forget who we are. But the truth is we belong to the son of the kingdom, the Prince Christ, who is going to invite us into the ball of his father's kingdom, where we will live forever for all eternity. It's like, that's why we love Cinderella. I'm like, amen, Father Baron, preach it, you know? This story, uh, I hope I don't spoil it for you, but um, there's one point in the story where uh, Cinderella talks to her stepmother, and her stepmother is just so hateful. And you know what? The truth is she's jealous. And the movie does a very good job of really showing the stepmother just staring at Cinderella and just utter jealousy and hatred when she sees the tender love that her father has for her. And you see, she's a woman who, who wants to take care of herself, who's concerned about herself and her daughters. And this other woman, this young, beautiful woman, seems like a threat to her. And so all this poison, all this vinegar just comes out of her heart as it's spewed onto this beautiful, innocent girl. And at what point Cinderella looks at her and she's like, why are, why are you being so cruel to me? She's like, I've done nothing to you to deserve this kind of treatment. And for one second, the stepmother has a bit of insight. And she says, I'm cruel to you because you're innocent and you're good and I'm... And she can't even finish her sentence. And you know the story, you know, the prince finally finds her and he fits the glass slipper on her foot. And all the way down the stairs, the stepmother's forbidding her to leave the house and saying, I will destroy you, you will never make it. And Cinderella takes the hand of the prince. And before she leaves the house, she looks up at her stepmother and she says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And as she goes down the stairs, the narrator of the story says, um, perhaps the greatest risk any of us will ever take is to be seen as we truly are. And uh, well, I worked for a long time, as I mentioned, with, with uh, children. And uh, if you knew me at all, you'd probably notice something about me that I'm a bit type A, okay? So I like things at right angles, right? 90 degrees is fine with me. So I like things at right angles, and I like things in order, and I like things to be on time, and I like this and this and this. And um, I, on purpose, did not major in education. I did not want to teach children. I didn't know what to do with kids. I, w I didn't have little brothers and little sisters. I didn't know what to do with them. So God said, well, let's put you in a daycare for eight years and see how that works for you. I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. So I know I never said that. And so um, we get there, and uh, so 
I've got 25 little kids from 3 to 6 o'clock every evening, and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, what? I, I don't know what to do, right? So somebody before me, the person who was the head of the daycare before me, had a schedule, and it was, you know, a very good schedule. I'm like, okay, we're going to, schedules are always a good thing. We're just going to follow the schedule. So at 3 o'clock, the kids would come into our daycare. At 3.15, we would have a snack, and there would be no goldfish on the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, so at 3.30, we would pick up, and we would go back into the room for a few minutes of playing, and you would put the Barbie's head back on the Barbie after you rip it off. There would be no headless Barbies in the Barbie doll, okay? So then we go out to play at the, at the thing, and the, you know, you don't cross the street, you don't cross the street in front of me, you don't do this, you don't do this, and then we would come back in for homework time, and it would be silent. Like, ain't nobody talking at homework time when I'm on duty, okay? So shh, silence. Schedules are a good thing. Or I, I meant well. I swear I meant well. Like I totally did. And I'm just trying to get order. And I'm overwhelmed. And I obviously got some vinegar coming out. Okay. And just you know all the ways that my mom and her stuff and my dad and his stuff. You know we kind of you know there's a saying that suffering that is not transformed is transmitted. I'm just trying to do the best I possibly can. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but I would go home after daycare and I'd still be fuming about something that happened that day. And it's 8 o'clock at night, and I'm like, I can't believe that little kid said that to me. When I see his mother tomorrow, I'm going to tell his mother that he said that to me, and I can't. And I'm in my mind, like, have you ever done that? It's doing over the whole day in my mind, like, I, you talk about joy gone, peace gone. It's like, I was just giving it away. Hey, you want my peace? You want my joy? You want my happiness? Here, take it, because I'll be miserable. I'm going to love it, right? It was awful. But I had no idea how my behavior, my vinegar, was affecting those around me. Until one day, God sent a little girl to tell me the truth. And uh, so we're standing in the daycare, and we're speaking about, there's a sister and I, and this little girl, she's about seven. And we're talking about Beauty and the Beast, and we're talking about Belle and Gaston, and just the whole story. And this sister, standing next to me, the sister looks at me, and she says to the little girl, she says, oh, Sister Miriam's the beauty, I'm the beast, huh? And that little girl looks up with me, with no guile, no sarcasm, and she says, Actually, Sister Miriam's the beast. <laughs> I was, more, and I just, it, if she wasn't snarky, she was the most sweet, innocent, like little chisel of sandpaper to do the masterpiece that God could possibly send. And her words pierced my heart. Because what she was saying to me was she was saying, You're hurting us. You're hurting us. And we know you mean well, but. Lord have mercy, you're killing us here, you know? <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no idea. And I tell you that I remember to this day that moment, and that happened probably 10 years ago. And that changed me. And my heart broke for those children. And I can't, I mean, so yeah, we had some goldfish on the floor to that. Some of the Barbies never had their heads back, you know, like that, stuff like that happens. And we had a schedule, and I tried to keep it quiet and stuff. But there was something about, um, I guess, being seen like as my masks, kind of like how I was trying to cope with the situation. Because that's not really who I am. I swear I'm really not a beast. Like, I try not to be, unless I'm out of coffee. But I really try not to be. That's really not me. But sometimes what we do is we have these security blankets of control that just take over. And so sometimes what our little kids would do is our little kids would bring security blankets to school. And they bring a little teddy bear or something, and especially if they have blankets, what they would do is they put their blanket on. And if you've ever had a little kid with a blanket, you know, like this is, you know, it has magical power. Sometimes they think it makes them invisible. They're like, you can't see me. I'm like, I could totally see you. You're sitting right there. I'm like, no, you can't. I'm like, yes, I can. But anyway, so here they got their blanket, and, it, you know, they won't let it go. If you've ever tried to wrestle a teddy bear or a security blanket from a kid, good, they'll bite your hand off, like good luck, you know? So they grab onto it, grab onto it, grab onto it. And so we would have to go across the street at our school, we had to go across the street to play in the playground. And we wouldn't usually let the kids take toys out to the playground because they would lose it. But every now and then, one of the kids would sneak a toy past us, right? <laughs> and so we get out to the playground and they're, they're here they are with this. We're like, what are, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. It, uh, don't you want to go play? No, why not? Well, I, I can't. Then I have to get rid of my blanket. I was like, well, don't you want to play? Yeah, but I, I, you know, I, I don't want to let go. I don't want to let go. Because you can't climb the monkey bars with one hand, right? So those kids would come sit next to us boring nuns <laughs> as we sat on the curb and watched the kids. And they'd sit there with their security blanket or their teddy bear. And they'd watch all their friends play. And their life was muted because they couldn't let go. And I was really struck by that because as a, an adult, you know, as, as you know, if you see your children, you, the teachers, the kids that you mentor, my mom tells me this all the time. Mom's like, I want, you to, I want you to be fully alive. 
I want you to do what God wants you to do. I want you to live an abundant life. That's her desire for me. And so for those kids as well, that's my desire for them. And it broke my heart to see that they're holding on to something like this, which started to stink after all. It was dirty, you know? But they would rather hold on to this stinky thing than face a life without what it might be like. And I tell you, this Lent, God showed me my security blankets. Um, areas in my life where I fight for control, um, where I want things a certain way, uh, I have all these kind of thought patterns where I feel like if I just cling on to something else other than God, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll fix myself, I'll fix this problem, and I'm just going to do it. And we just pull these things on so tight to us, and after a while, our life becomes muted. And we kind of sit in the sideline because we're so afraid to let go. Maybe we're afraid we might be vulnerable or we might be so quote, quote unquote naked, so to speak. So we just cling on to these things. Sometimes these are the labels people give us. Um, you know, you grow up in a family, all the kids are usually labeled as something. So sometimes as an adult, you take those labels right into adulthood. Oh yeah, I was the dumb one. You know, everybody said I was dumb in the family, so I'm the dumb one, or I'm this one, or I'm that one. Or people say, oh, you're so this, you're so this, and we just kind of, I don't know, we just, after a while, we kind of take those things on. This security blanket is very, 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 very different. This self-imposed kind of grasping thing that we so often do is very different than the mantle of dignity that God gives us in our baptism. And my professor this last semester was speaking extensively about baptism. This is the robe, this is the mantle, okay, of baptism. And if you can't see it, it says, Beloved Child of God. And at our baptism, an indelible mark is placed upon our soul that forever marks us as being children of God. And I love it because in the catechism, this is staggering to think that the catechism says that no sin can ever erase the mark. It's indelible. It says sin might prevent the fruit of salvation, which is really sobering to think of. Sin might prevent the fruit of salvation, but there's no sin that can ever erase this. And you see time and time again that the mantle is placed on God's chosen ones. The daughter of the king is clothed with splendor, her robes embroidered with pearl set gold. And when the prodigal son comes home, the father says, quick, get a mantle, get a robe, put it on and put it on his shoulders, put a ring on his finger, because he belongs to me. And when I know who I am as a daughter of God, this is not a dignity that anybody can give me and I'm not a dignity that nobody can take away, no matter what has happened, no matter what people say, at the end of our life, we will not ju be judged by a jury of our peers. Thank God. A Facebook poll says 50% of your followers think you should go to heaven. <laughs> the other 50%, well, someplace else. We're like, hmm, hope not, right? No. No, 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 no. At the end of our life, we can only imagine we will see God face to face. And we're going to have a very honest conversation, so to speak. I know a woman who, who um, she's beautiful, she's married, and she and her husband have four kids. And uh, they're wonderful parents, and they've got all their stuff just like anybody else. But I, she's a dear friend of mine, and I spend a lot of time with her family. And I just noticed uh, one day that she just lives differently. And I was like, what is it about her? Because her life is certainly not perfect. But her, she just lives differently. She's somebody who, you know, she doesn't gossip. She doesn't compare people. She doesn't criticize. She's just such a beautiful person. Like this joy that just comes. She's so contagiously joyful. And, I, you know, her husband loves her. Her husband's amazing. I mean, oh, my gosh. And that man loves his wife. And her kids love her and all that kind of stuff. But I finally realized one day when I was watching her at her house, and I said, oh, I finally figured it out. You know you're loved. And not just by your husband, by your kids. You know you're loved by God. You know that you're a beloved child of God. And when you know that, you live differently. Like Pope Benedict says, the one who has hope lives differently. And it's not magic. It's not like she didn't have any problems. But it's somebody who got so honest with all of her security blankets and all of her wounds. And she talked to people. She got help. She relied upon the power of God. And that woman walks with God. And it's beautiful. And it can be very vulnerable, don't you think? Um, C.S. Lewis is a very famous quote from his book, The Four Loves. And he talks about love. And um, he says this uh, in his book. He says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries 
and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or the coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, and impenetrable, and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. I think the most vulnerable thing uh, somebody could do would be to give themselves naked upon the cross. You had no sin and was crucified for us to set us free. This is the bridegroom who gives himself for his bride so his bride can live. And there's something within us that this incredible vulnerability that love requires. And it's hard, isn't it? I think we've all had relationships where we've just said, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. <laughs> And we kind of just close off a bit and we, we, we pull back a bit and then we see how Christ continually gives and gives and gives and gives of himself. And God makes himself vulnerable. He comes as a baby. You know, it's, I was telling some of the teens earlier this week that, you know, Jesus, when you, when you hold a baby and you look into their eyes, you see eternity. And he comes so humble that he would, I mean, it's staggering to think of, like, we can barely say we're sorry sometimes. He comes as a human baby, a baby that would have died had Mary and Joseph not taken care of him. And you can imagine Mary, you know, Mary and Joseph teaching him how to talk and teaching whatever their dialect, you know, they had and teaching him how to walk. And if they had coffee tables back then, he probably hit his little head on the coffee table as he's learning how to walk, you know. So human. And like we talked about earlier, he's always touching people, he's always engaging. Like he's so vulnerable, so vulnerable. And he willingly lays his life down for us to set us free. And not just people 2,000 years ago, but every single one of us that sits in this room, every single person that's ever been created is redeemed by God. And like Pope Francis said earlier, once if we accept that redemption, our lives are transformed. In the gospel, he says this. He says, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I love this, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. No one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. The Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. Whenever we take a step toward Jesus, we come to realize that he is already there, waiting for us with open arms. I was listening to a talk one time uh, at a 12-step meeting, and this woman, she's wonderful, she was talking about it, this, the, the points in our life where maybe, I don't know where you find yourself this evening, whatever is going on in your life, and, and you know we need to go from here, like say we need to go from here to here, okay? And we know that maybe we've got some problems here, we've got some pain that needs to be dealt with, we've got some anger, and we're afraid to even express that. As long as I think we're afraid that God might be mad at us or something, as if God doesn't know. Our anger, our sorrow at events, is not offensive to him. I just want to say that. It is his desire that we come and bring our hearts into full honesty with him. So whatever it is, whether you need to go forgive somebody, you need to say you're sorry, you need to clean up your side of the street. So we find ourselves here, but we know we need to go here, but we're kind of like stuck right here. <laughs> and we know we need to go over here, but we just don't want to. It's like we, we need to surrender, but we just don't want to. And she said this, she said, you know, did you know that you can ask God for the willingness to be willing? I was like, oh, that's brilliant, right? She said, whatever you're facing in your life right now that you know you need help with, and if there's some things in your life you know you need to do it and you just don't want it or, or you don't want to do it or whatever it is you need help, she said, ask God for the willingness to be willing. And I tell you, my dear friends, that prayer that I have made not only that day when I heard her speak, but I've made that prayer time and time and time and time and time again in my life areas in my own life where I needed to forgive. Because see, forgiveness for a long time, I had all this trauma, abuse in my life as a child, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of addiction in my own life, a lot of brokenness, it was anger. And my anger wasn't out here, my anger was in here. It manifested itself as clinical depression and self-abuse and all kinds of just broken, broken stuff. And I was an angry young lady, oh my gosh. And I thought that, you know what, if I forgave that person who hurt me, if I forgave them, if I said, I forgive you, then it's like I was letting them off the hook. And I'm like, I can't let them off the hook because they nearly destroyed my life. They left scars on my heart that I'll have the rest of my life. I can't, I can't do it. So I just flat out refused to forgive that person. And every time I saw that person, I let them know how much I hate their guts because that's how, that's how mature I was, right? Till a very wise woman came into my life one day and she kind of took stock of my life and just saw the, all the mess. And she said, you know, um, Forgiveness, she said, forgiveness is not letting somebody off the hook. 
It's releasing your grasp on them and entrusting them to God. One of the biggest obstacles to healing in our life is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And so when we get stuck in unforgiveness, a lot of times what happens is we have a hard time letting God encounter us. Because he's always coming to encounter us because he loves us. But it becomes a security blanket of our own making where we just keep everybody at bay and we just say, you stay here, you stay here, I'm going to stay here, and and we're going to be just fine. But I would propose that we long for so much more. That we long for joy. You know, so often we see that little kids, there's a reason why Jesus tells us to become childlike, not childish, but childlike. And the more honest we are as adults, the more we let, the best gift we can give our kids is to let God come heal us. So we're not continually transferring onto them what was transferred onto us, all of our brokenness, that we become rivers of living water that joy just pours forth from. And that I believe on top of anything. I mean, I look at the political situation, all this stuff going on in America, and what's coming to us in the next 10 years frightens me to death. But I tell you this, the most powerful thing the world is looking for is an authentic witness of love and joy. And that is not something that I can conjure up or anybody else can conjure up. That comes from an ongoing encounter with Jesus Christ, this man that loves us, that does not disappoint us, that is always waiting for us even before we ask. So it is my prayer for you. Um, I've told the teams this all week long, and I'll make this promise to you as well. This is the only promise that I make. I promise every group that I speak to, that as my mother did, my mother at one point in my life was so just overwhelmed, she was just done with me. Oh my gosh, we butted heads for so long, and at one point she just had had enough of me. She didn't know what to do. And I was dating some guy my parents didn't like, and you know, I, my mom had financially cut me off, and then she threatened to disown me, and I was like, I don't care, don't tell me what to do. And my dad, my sweet father, if you're a father in this room and you have a daughter, please, I beg you, please speak into the life of your daughter. As daughters, we need to hear from you. And it might be totally awkward, but that's okay, Dad. Fight the awkwardness. <laughs> Tell her that you love her. Tell her you're sorry. Speak into her life of who she is, because she learns about that from you. She longs to hear she's beautiful from her daddy. And you know, my dad, I know my dad loved me very much, but he just, God bless that man, may he rest in peace. He just did not know how to say it. So he didn't say many things very soft-spoken man, you know, the southern man, very quiet man. But, and so I know some of you heard the story already this week, but um, one, one weekend my parents came to visit me in college, and here I was playing Division One college volleyball and wanted to work for ESPN, but I'm an alcoholic, I guess I got all these secrets, I had just layers and layers of secrets, but I had this nice facade on, and I was this person here and this person here, but my life was a mess. So, oh my gosh, such shame, such self depression all kinds of stuff going on. And my dad, my mom and dad came down, and my mother like, had been lecturing me for a long time, but it was the first time my dad, my sweet father, kind of finally saw how I was living my life. And he kind of took stock of my living situation and just what I was doing, and he didn't say anything to me, which was you know, not, char- not out of character for him. And they went home. And it wasn't until after my father passed away and I made my vows, um, my mom said, sit down, I want to tell you a story. She said, remember that weekend your dad and I came to visit you in college? And I was like, yeah, I totally remember that. She said, here's what happened that night. She said, your dad and I went home. And she said, your dad looked at me and your dad said to me, I'm not going to give my daughter away to that man that she's dating to be married. I'm not going to do it. And my mom knew for my sweet father to finally say that. She knew how disappointed he was in me. She didn't know what else to do. So she said that night she got out of bed in the basement of our house. We have a beautiful statue of our blessed mother. And that night my mom got on her knees before that statue. And she poured her heart out to our blessed mother. And she said, Mother, she's your daughter now because there's nothing I can do for her. I can't help her. I can't heal her. I can't control her. And as you are the mother of Jesus Christ, I entrust my daughter to you as your daughter. And I ask that you would heal her, that you'd watch over her, that you would help her because I can. And I give her to you. And I am 800 miles away, I'm an alcoholic, I'm living in mortal sin, my life's a mess, and it's just a train wreck. And completely unknown to me, my mom starts to pray from that day on that I become a nun. (laughs) Here I am today before you. So I believe in the power of prayer. Um, So often we kind of relegate that to wishful thinking. Prayer is not wishful thinking. 
It is going before our Father, and God always, always, always hears our prayers, always. And they may not be answered in the way we would like them to be answered on this side of heaven, but he always hears them. And I would like to tell you that um, I will entrust all of you to our Blessed Mother. And I have a, you know, people that I pray for every single day, and those people include the people that I speak to, and I promise you that I will entrust all of you to her, your marriages, your lives, your destinies, whatever you struggle with, whatever your deepest dreams are. I will trust those to our Blessed Mother, and I promise you that I'll pray for you every day for the rest of my life. I want you to know that love is real. Authentic love is real. And the joy that Christ offers us is not just something that we tell kids at Christmas time, but it's a reality. It's an eternal reality for every single one of us. It's my prayer for your, for your schools, for your families, for your country, that this love would become, this love would come to life and give birth and be a beautiful, powerful light in the midst of the world. So thank you for coming this evening, and God bless you. Amen.